material or a worm can go from a tomato to the brain without even caring <laughs> if it's human or not human. <laughs> so we really need other ways of thinking. That's what I think that the Anthropocene is, you know, demanding from us. It's a new reflection, it's a new discourse, a new categories and new sensibilities as well. You know, but if you were working on voice, you know, I would suggest Adriana Caravet. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I come in, I will be late. Um, I don't know if I understand the word, but I would like to clarify if we can understand anthropocenes like a performance of the bodies in relation to the nature in your discussions. And what, in some way, what is the, what is the difference that we can find between the conceptualization of theory, theoretical perspectives of voice and um, and language? Is the same? We can overlap both voice and language because I think it's in the way when I watch things uh, or watch the video, for example. Okay, I don't understand what the people were saying in you know, what you know saying in that moment, but I feel I we feel uh, we have some kind of connection, but it's not only the materiality materialities of voice, it's also the materialities of the body. But you said that the bodies or the conceptualization of the bodies is like as esoteric, but that we need to reconceptualize these particular concepts and I would like to to, to 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 understand more a, a little bit about why this connection between the materialities of voice as well as the materialities of bodies, these uh, connections and the differentiations between voice theoretically and language of if we can overlap both concepts and we can separate, for example, the materialities of voice with the materialities of the body. Well, if we, well, I think that, you know, materiality of voice and materiality of the, bo the body, body, they are interconnected, intermeshed. How can you, the, what, what makes voice? Mm -hmm. It's the, the vocal cords vibrating here. There is a materiality here, right? Mm -hmm. And the way voice sounds also, the, when you hear there is a materiality of the act of listening. Uh, I don't see, I don't know how you would uh, disconnect, separate the material boy, body from the material voice, the materiality of voice. I see them very much intermeshed and interconnected. And uh, what happens is that when you say the voice and language, Voice doesn't necessarily, in that case, language is unnecessary, superfluous to what we were hearing the chant. It's, it's not voice, it was the chant. And you see that as he chanted, he was, that thing that he was, has a meaning also. Do you know uh, that little thing that he was shaking? One student told me what that represented. Mm. in African religious, that instrument. And that's in the way he was pacing and covering and singing, but covering one of his ears. And so that all brings not only voice, immaterial voice, but voice, embodied voice. And that's what Adriana Cavara said. We have to always think of voice as always already embodied and not separate voice from the body. It's part of the, what causes voice is the materiality of the body. And so I don't know if I answer your question, but I don't see them separate. I don't see you can separate them. They are intersmashed and the question of voice doesn't necessarily require language to move you, to affect you. So, you know, that, that's why I brought that example. Uh, did I answer you? So I'm thinking in a lot of specific events. Um, for example, in my case, I was starting to, um, on memory, 
songs in black women's memory um, in terms of the trauma that they feel, um, black women that are victims of their recovery. And it's not the same, for example, that we can narrate or we can show my stories about how the co-element conflicts affect me and the way in which another person can't explain the same situations. There is not the same body's language or the voices of the victimized in the cases and the victims. And um, even though we can't explain the same event, for example, we can um, utilize our bodies in a different way, and so we can't in some ways, I think maybe the victimized tends to separate the, the, the voice from the body. Difference to the victims that they incorporate the voices and the bodies in the moment that they are explaining some particular traumas or a particular mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. That is my concern was uh, because oh, I was thinking in, in, in that way. Yeah, I, I understand now mm. your perspective. And yes, and then I would agree with you that mm -hmm. you incorporate the voices of the victimized. So the voice of the victimized are there and you bring it to, is that it? Right, and you embodied it. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, in that sense, yes. I understand what, what you're saying. And I agree. I, I, want, I, I, I wanted to hear more about the concept of gender as an equivocal category. Yeah, uh, that sounded very interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, well, I was reading about this notion of equivocation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is in the sense that, you know, for the Amerindians, for instance, uh, a uh, manioc beverage, you know, uh, for the Amerindians is considered for the jaguar, uh, for the jaguar, manioc beverage. For the jaguar, it's one thing. For the Amerindians, it's another. For the jaguar, jaguar, it's blood. <laughs> if, you know, this is for the jaguar, manioc beverage. For the uh, for the Amerindians, it's a beverage they take to you know with hallucinogenous content and etc. So the same thing has two different mean This you know, mm -hmm. there is one meaning, but two different things. And so what Eduardo Vivius de Carlos said, this is the example of equivocation. You seem to be talking about the same thing, but in fact, you are not. Uh, and he works this notion of equivocation as, you know, equivocation is also translation, but not in the sense that it's a failure of translation, but it's in the sense that it's unavoidable failure because there is no way of translating this into this. Okay. And then all this debate about gender uh, between Lugones that cites uh, Oyumi, that cites uh, another, you know, indigenous, U.S. indigenous uh, woman writer. What's her name? I don't remember. Uh, Paula and some, and it, uh, that Paula would, huh? no, no, no. They all say that, you know, in indigenous communities there was no gender. Both were human about Africa mm -hmm. and this Paula Ganellan about the indigenous Americans. And Julieta Paredes would say, no, gender, was a category. What happened was entroncamiento de patriarcado, but gender existed, but in a different kind of uh, dualism, man and female, or a dualism, but not a hierarchical one. And then Rita Segato comes and says, you know, gender was present in Yoruba society, gender categories were present in Yoruba society before uh, colonization, conquest. So, they all are saying, you know, gender exists. The, so in order to get out of this, did it exist, let's bring more evidence. It didn't exist, let's bring more evidence. 
why not think it as an equivocal category, having different meanings in different contexts for different people? So I use this gender as an equivocal category uh, to circumvent this debate that I don't think will take us anywhere, just bringing more evidence to the debate. But there are also irreconcilable differences, yes, right? Yes, I mean, so it means that, yeah. so that, that example, the difference between Lugones and Paredes is also therefore a political one. Um, yeah, you know, so it, because it's not like, oh well, gee, we have different conceptions of gender because that of has course, this consequences. Of course, political uh, consequences. But to understand that those that you're basically in a you know kind of a different political camp if you're saying yes. that gender existed before yeah. and not just after coloniality. Yeah. Right? And Under, then at the last uh, uh, table <laughs> on the colonial <laughs> feminism, we had a debate of Felia Schultz saying what gender meant for her and Julieta Paredes saying what attacking a failing saying that gender was a category of anger, something like this. And became like a very awkward moment. And then I said, oh, see, this is an equi a moment of equivocation. And Julieta said, Claudia becomes the UN, comes <laughs> <laughs> Instead of throwing fire, throwing, uh, how do you say, uh, Lenya, I forget. Like fuel to the fire. <laughs> yeah, you know. I try to say, you know, different, with, of course, with different political implications. So, she, Julieta was criticizing Ophelia Schultz's very, you know, uh, uh, decaffeinated view of gender. <laughs> yes. And she was bringing to uh, the the question of in, indigenous oppression and much more forceful, and that's why. Yeah, but but, but I think it's an, an interesting way to talk about you know, f for instance, I don't know, very concretely, some expressions of Black feminism's take on the relationship between, between gender and race that just doesn't jive or doesn't isn't readable by some white Eurofeminist or. It, it, it's not, which is not to say that that's a, some sort of a yeah. intrinsic or ontological thing, but but to you know to recognize it for that and not as you know I just don't understand. Yeah. No. No. And I mean, I, and really, just I just don't understand. Like, explain to me, you know, because I'm obviously I'm getting it wrong. I hear gender, but that's not what you mean. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that's very compelling. Mm -hmm. Well, we should. Um, Anybody else have anything? No? It is time? Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.